Dr. Ashley Dunn is originally from Maryland's Eastern Shore. While she grew up with lots of pets, she didn't discover veterinary medicine until a life-changing experience after her freshman year of college. She has a bachelor's degree in biology from St. Mary's College of Maryland, and she attended the Virginia Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. After graduating vet school in 2011, she practiced general small animal medicine in Lexington, Kentucky for a year before moving to New Hampshire. In 2013, she made the transition to full-time emergency medicine and in 2015 was promoted to medical director of the emergency hospital. As far as her personal life, she was married and had her first child while in vet school. Her second child was born in 2013, coinciding with her job transition to ER. She divorced in 2016 and has shared parenting. This journey has been another challenging aspect of her life that she's only recently feeling Feeling settled into. Welcome to the podcast, Dr. Ashley Dunn. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much. I'm glad I, to be here. I understand you just walked in the door from getting home from work. You went in to do a little administrative work at the hospital. Yep. It's not, not all the medical stuff anymore. Well, thank you for making time despite your incredibly busy schedule. What I must imagine must be incredible busy, incredibly busy, considering you're an ear vet, now a medical director, and a mother of two, of two children, young children. But um, before we yeah. get into all that, I want to ask you a little bit about your pre-veterinary life. And um, you mentioned in your bio that you didn't discover veterinary medicine until you were an undergrad. So what, what happened? What path were you on before that, and then what changed your mind to go into veterinary medicine? Yeah, I, to be honest, I wasn't sure what path I was on at that point. Um, I, was, I excelled at all of my classes in high school, so deciding on one particular path over another was really difficult for me, actually. I mean, it really took a very big event to give me a, a big push. I was fortunate that I kind of fell into that. I... The summer between graduating high school and freshman year of college, I had worked at the local Humane Society, but just to clean kennels and have a job. It wasn't any particular drive. And I'd grown up with lots and lots of different pets, but never really had a particular drive towards veterinary medicine. The night that I got home from my freshman year of college, I got a phone call from the Humane Society, and they had done a massive raid on a house with the help of HSUS, the Humane Society of the United States. They'd taken over 250 cats and 18 dogs out of one house and several adjoining outbuildings. And this is a really tiny, I mean, this is a very rural county, very rural humane society. I think we had all of 20 dog runs, could maybe have held 20 cats in the cat room on a good day. So this was overwhelming to say the least. Thankfully, there was a big warehouse and another uh, double wide trailer that had been repurposed for vaccine clinics and things, but they needed help. They needed live bodies. Um, so I spent the entire summer working with these cats, all of whom were sick in some form or another. The house was um, a biohazard zone and required suits to go into. And oh. while the cats had respiratory illnesses, 75% of them had either feline leukemia or FIV or both. Uh, the woman had been running a rescue. She was a 501c3 Chubbers Animal Rescue. Oh. She had she was just using it as a cover to hoard. She would go to shelters up and down the East Coast. And initially she was a godsend because she'd go to a shelter and a kill shelter like ours was. And we had given her cats previously. And in high summer, when you're euthanizing quite a lot of animals for lack of space, she'd clean out the cat room and say, I'm going to take these guys and I'll adopt them out. So initially it was great. And she was also telling owners who had FBLV or FIV positive cats, you can relinquish them to me. I'll keep them in separate rooms. You don't have to euthanize them. They can live out their lives. They clearly weren't separate and everybody was together. So it was, it was a huge mess. And HSUS sent in a couple of different veterinarians um, to help out and guide organization, treatment programs, medications, that sort of thing. So I spent uh, the whole summer working alongside a couple of different veterinarians and vet techs to 
organize and, and treat these cats. Uh, we had to take care of all of them for the first 36 days uh, before we got to court and had um, a, a trial on the disposition of them, basically, before we were given ownership of those cats to then be able to euthanize the ones that were were positive and, and were not going to be adoptable. Mm-hmm. And in the end, we we kept 75 or 80 of them who remained negative over several months before we then uh, adopted all of them out, um, the ones that were negative. Mm-hmm. So that was, I, like I said, I'd worked with the animals in that shelter before, but this was different. This was very sick animals coming in. And even the ones that were FELV or FIV positive got better, you know, 36 days in <laughs> ventilation and a clean environment, food and water, right. uh, you know, topical meds and things. Uh, they all got clinically better. And I got to see that. Um, and so that was, that really was the, the impetus before, before even that 36 days was up, I had already decided that I wanted to go to vet school. It, that's all that took. Uh, so I went back to, back to school in the fall and looked up what I needed to go to vet school and changed my whole course load. And off, off I went. (laughs) Off you went. (laughs) That's what I say. Off I went. (laughs) So, um, what, I mean, what, this woman was convicted, I presume. Yes. Um, Yeah. Did she, did she have to do her and her significant other, uh, Linda Favre and Ernie Mills, they, they both were convicted. Yes. Uh, Did they have to do any jail time? (sighs) I believe, I don't recall. It's been a long time now. It's amazing how long it's been. (laughs) Right. Right. Well, let me ask you this. I mean, you, you were working with those veterinarians and caring for these animals. And did you talk to the veterinarians and say, I'm thinking this is making me feel like I want to be like you. Did you did you talk to them about it? And what did they say? I did, actually. And one veterinarian in, in particular, Dr. Leslie Sinclair, who actually practices uh, in, in Maryland, on the western shore of Maryland currently. And she and I reconnected in the last couple of months via Facebook, which was pretty exciting. But, yeah, I, I remember saying something to her. And um, the night that we got disposition of the cats and returned to the shelter and, and ended up euthanizing the ones that were not going to be adoptable. I remember her coming to me in one of the little side rooms and asking me point blank, so do you still think you want to go to vet school? And I told her yes, because it, you know, it was very difficult. It was, it was a really rough time, but like I said, the 75 or 80 that still came from that were negative they were they were all adopted out. You know, like I said we, we were a small shelter and we did you know, we, we had animal control so we took everything in and had a pretty large number of euthanasias just because there's no way to keep that many animals. But we made the commitment that these animals have been through enough as long as it takes, if they're here for six months or a year, we'll adopt every last one of the healthy ones out. Mm-hmm. So that to me was was and still is worth it. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So she was concerned that you might have been dissuaded by all the euthanasias that had to be performed. But yeah, it was a pretty it's a pretty heavy night. It was a pretty uh, big deal to to do in one you know in one go. Mm-hmm. But still, even those cats, they didn't you know there were there were multiple corpses in various states of decomposition Mm. in that house Mm. and so yes there were a large number of cats euthanized once we got disposition of them but they were healthier they'd been fed Mm. they they were loved we named every last one of them 250 plus cats got a name and there's now a plaque outside of the humane society that has all of their names on it so we we still tried as much as we could to honor to honor them and make sure that they they didn't perish in the way that they would have in that house. Right, right, yeah. Well, that's a great perspective to have. I mean, it was hard, but also necessary, but also um, it was probably the best month, couple of months of their lives, you know, that you, that you gave them. 
it probably it probably was. And I think I sent you a, a picture of me in um, the double wide room where one of, of cats and yeah, for the first week, 70 cats just loose in that room because we didn't have enough cages. <laughs> it, wow. took, it took a week to get enough cages. And even then, you know, we'd have your, your large size dog crate would have two or three cats in it. Just that initially that's what we could manage. Wow. So, but yeah, that, that picture that I sent you was from, from that first week. Wow. What amazing story. And so um, then when you, you got into vet school on your first try, I take it. I did. Yes. Yeah. And was Virginia, Maryland, the only school that you applied to? No, I applied to five. I did Cornell, Tufts, Missouri, Mississippi, and Virginia Tech. Okay. Yeah. Uh, Cornell flat out didn't want me, which is fine. <laughs> I was wait, wait listed at Tufts, Mississippi, Missouri, and I was admitted to Virginia Tech. Yeah. And I am originally from Maryland. So at the time, it was the Virginia, Maryland Regional College of Veterinary Medicine. So uh, it's considered in state. So I elected to go there. It's closer to home and while still expensive, much better than going out of state. Oh sure. my God, for sure. I, I um, interviewed at Tufts as well. And you know, what a beautiful school, beautiful campus. And, uh, but whew, I mean, just living expenses in that area mm -hmm. were, I mean, it, it probably, my estimation is it probably would have been twice what living expenses were in Blacksburg, Virginia. Yeah. <laughs> and absolutely. Blacksburg is so beautiful. Yeah. So all for the best. It is. It is. Part of, part of my reasoning for applying to Tufts was I had done their summer pre-vet program, which I would definitely recommend to anybody that just wants to get a, a feel and, and a little more hands-on flavor for it. They have a really wonderful week-long pre-vet program where you go and you stay. It wasn't a dorm. It was a hotel kind of thing, but uh, you spend the week shadowing fourth-year students. How fun. And you're in, in the hospital and you got to sit in on basically the rounds with the fourth years and the clinicians and hear and, and see what they were talking about and working up. So that was a really excellent other introduction to the realities of that school while I was still an undergrad. Oh, that's, uh, that's incredible. I never even heard of that. Thank you. I'll put that in the show notes. And did you have to apply for it? I believe so. And I think it was, you know, it was pricey. It was probably $1,500 or something. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a, it was a very fun experience. I really enjoyed it. Yeah. It included all room and board or just room and the board was on you. <laughs> I, I honestly can't remember. Yeah. And to That's be, fine. to be honest, my parents probably handled more of the finances of it. So, um, no, I, I, I don't, I don't remember. That's fine. I'm it sure was, it's probably changed um, anyway, um, maybe more. Expensive. Yeah, that's, that's exactly right. Yeah. I mean, it's, goodness, it's been more than a decade now. I, Time passes very quickly. So I, I know I can't believe it faster every year. Darn it. Um, so when you got to uh, Virginia, Maryland, um, what, like, how did you feel about vet school? What are your general perceptions and what was your favorite part and what was your least favorite part? It, it was definitely tough. There was a lot of, of lecture in the first year or so. It's is tedious because it's a lot of memorization of intricacies of anatomy or biochem or, you know, there, there definitely was a lot of time spent studying and reading. I feel like it was as intense as I expected it to be. I mean, I, I expected it to be pretty all consuming. So mm -hmm. I wasn't too surprised by that. It was also a different change of pace though, in that I had never planned to do an internship or residency. So while I still, I still cared about my grades and I still wanted to do well in my classes. It wasn't like in undergrad yeah. where you've got to get good grades if you're looking towards vet school because your GPA matters. You know, I didn't want to fail anything. I still didn't enjoy getting B's and C's. Yeah. 
but it was a little liberating in that regard that if I didn't do as well as before, there wasn't the same pressure, which I wasn't entirely expecting. But yeah, once I got there, it's like, okay, well, I passed the class. I'm still on to next, I'm still on to next semester next year. So yeah, I, I, I enjoyed it. I, you know, it was, we had a really good class as well. And we all seem to mesh well and have, have good personalities that got together and you know, we had a lot of fun in this high stakes, stressful environment. So, yeah, I, th- I think we were very lucky in the class that we were in. Um, I've heard from other people that um, from different classes, you know, that there's more competition, more cattiness. And uh, I didn't, you know, I didn't really pick up on much of that at all in our class. It was no, not me either. It was really cohesive. I'm so grateful for that. Looking back. Yeah. Um, and uh, so what was your favorite part about veterinary school? Finally being there, you know, it, like in the, the hands-on stuff, finally learning and putting these things together that I'd, you know, gotten glimpses of when, when I came back to undergrad after that, that summer with the rescue cats, I had gotten a job at a large high volume general practice close to school. And I got to see a lot there, which I think really helped me in vet school because I'd already had um, some exposure to hepatic lipidosis or, or, you know, when I went to that, the Tufts pre-vet thing in one of the fourth year rounds, I, I knew what an intussusception was. And that wasn't from vet school. It was from working at this other job. So I'd, I'd gotten to see and do a lot. So it was nice to start putting some of that together. Um, but it's, it's definitely once you get to the, the, the hands-on stuff, even if it was the large animal things, I, I enjoyed doing the, the cow palpations on Saturdays and you enjoyed that. <laughs> finally doing stuff. <laughs> well, I enjoyed it because I, I enjoyed it because it didn't have any pressure. It, it was, I could just, I could just do it and learn and it didn't matter. <laughs> Terrible, but my uh, my my first rotation fourth year, I very deliberately picked large animal medicine for my my first rotation fourth year. One because it was going to be May in yes. Blacksburg and it was going to be gorgeous. And I could yes, be outside for three weeks at the end of a semester of studying. So that was really really nice. Two, I was a small animal track, so I knew that the the clinicians probably weren't going to expect amazing things from a brand new fourth year small animal tracker. And I, I could just, I really thoroughly enjoyed it because I could be outside and be hands on and learn without all of the pressure that this is my patient and I know I'm going to be doing this in the future. So I really need to know all of this. You, you, there's only so much space in your brain and time in the day. So mm-hmm. It's a little bit in the same, you know, work, work smarter, not harder. Well, I, I think that was my, very smart. Very yeah, smart. Save, save my time and energy and studying for, you know, the, the small animal medicine and surgery and neuro and the tracks that I really, truly knew that I was going to need in the rest of my career mm-hmm. and, and still enjoy it. Like, I thoroughly enjoyed my large animal rotation. Mm-hmm. I did too, retrospectively. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of funny stories from it, but oh boy, yes. Now, uh, rectal palpations was not my favorite thing. Um, <laughs> but you had your first child um, in veterinary school, right? I did. Um, I did. What, what, that was, was that our second year? It was the summer between second and third year, yes. Okay. So wow. it was uh, not not planned, but it ended up working out okay. Um, And in retrospect, I would not entirely advise against it for a couple of reasons. So my my son ended up being born on July 15th, which was two days shy of exactly six weeks before classes started again. So I, I still had six weeks home with him. Granted, obviously that was pure chance. 
I, I was very fortunate in that regard. I was very fortunate to have a pretty low risk, low complication pregnancy and delivery. So, which is not, not at all a guarantee and nothing, nothing that you can plan for or nothing that you're going to know until it happens. Mm-hmm. But, and I mean, initially they, they sleep a lot. <laughs> so I studied a lot while he was sleeping. I also changed my, again, getting back to the difference in pressure between undergrad and vet school. I dropped classes and I only took the, basically the bare minimum number of credits third year. Mm-hmm. It was only required to take, I think, 12 credits. So that's what I took. And at the time, I was a little worried, like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm not taking all my classmates are taking oncology or they're taking advanced diagnostic imaging. They're, they're taking these other things that are interesting and potentially very useful for a small animal practitioner. Mm-hmm. And I'm not taking them. I only took the one semester of surgery. I didn't take that second semester, which was uh, a elective and, and optional. Right. But seven years out now, the fact that I missed oncology and advanced diagnostic imaging has not mattered at all. And here's, here's the difference between having a kid in having a newborn in, in vet school versus a newborn in my job. If I didn't sleep well at night, I could skip my 9 a.m. lecture. You don't sleep well and you've got appointments starting at 9 a.m., you got to get up and you got to go to work. You can't just say, oh, I had a really rough night with the baby and we didn't sleep at all. No. Just reschedule all of those appointments. So like I said, I, I wouldn't entirely advise against it. it. It definitely depends on your home environment and what support you have. It's, it's not easy, but it, it, I got through it and it worked out okay. Age wise, I'm glad I had, you know, my, my first several years earlier than um, many people do. I mean, by the time uh, most people graduate vet school, they're in their late 20s or early 30s already. Mm-hmm. It starts to become, especially as a woman, mm-hmm. once you're into your mid 30s, it starts to become much more difficult to conceive and then have that low risk pregnancy. Mm-hmm. So, Hmm. Now, did you have a uh, family in the area to, to, to depend on? I did oh. not actually. Who, who um, took was, care of your baby while you were at school? Uh, just my, my husband at the time was working primarily nights um, and weekends. So okay. we, didn't, wow. we didn't see each other terribly much, <laughs> but uh, he was home during the day while I was at school. Okay. Wow. And I was home. I was home at night while he was at work. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Because I mean, that would have that would be a requisite of of, of the situation. Right. Somebody's got to be watching the baby while you're at school. And jog my memory a little bit, Doctor Dunn, because um, per my memory, we were not allowed to not show up for class. Like, oh, technically, you could, you know, you could, you know, have absences because you were sick or there was a family emergency, but attendance was mandatory. Did I'll be entirely actually, honest. I don't remember. <laughs> it was mandatory. And I, I mean, did you just not show up for any nine o'clock lectures? No, I, I went, I went to almost all of them. I was also very fortunate in the way that the classes broke down. Plus with not taking all of these extra electives for the most part, that first semester, I think I had class from like nine to 11 and then lab in the afternoon, like one to three for quite a while there. So I was able to get up in the morning, feed and care for the baby, baby down for a nap, go to school for a couple of hours, come home again, feed and care for the baby in the middle of the day, put the baby down for another nap and go back to school in the afternoon. Um, Again, I was, there's, there's a lot of chance. There's a lot of where I, I got fortunate to have a baby that pretty well and like I said I, I didn't have other complications or issues that definitely could have come up and made it more difficult I don't I don't specifically remember skipping a lot of classes um, but I also to be honest don't entirely remember the the true ins and outs of class attendance but it, it also always depended on which which class and which teacher because boy if you skip Dr. Pelzer's he'd call you out by name next time uh-huh. so <laughs> Uh-huh. Yeah. And some of them she would knew like, everybody by name on your permanent name. record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah. Well, so I thought um, I thought clinical rotations were really challenging. Um, just because we had to spend so many hours in the hospital, you know, on, on the small animal rotations, particularly, um, or I know some people had a really um, rough experience with their equine rotations, but spending, you know, 12, 16, there was, there was one time when I was in the teaching hospital for 36 hours straight. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, that's clinical rotations. So yeah. was that particularly challenging for you as a new mother with a, a little tiny baby? It, it was. I mean, by that point, he was, he was about nine months when I started fourth year. And at that point, my, my husband at the time did stop working at that point because there was just no way that I could guarantee to be home at any particular time. Yeah, so yeah, that's that, that was so how we unpredictable. made it through fourth year. Yeah, wow, exactly. Yeah, okay, all right. And then so and you had on call at that point as well. Pardon so me. Even if you were, and you had on call. Oh, God. well. So even if you were, you know, even if you had a good day and you were home at five, then you'd be paged back right in the middle of the night. So yep. I didn't even go home when I was on call. <laughs> I just slept in one of the conference rooms. I had a blanket and a pillow and an alarm clock, which I never needed because the pager just went off, you know, every hour, yeah. every two hours, whatever. <laughs> yeah. I lived really, I lived right off of Main Street, so that it helped that I wasn't too terribly far away if I did have to get up and come in. There was one, I had my, you mentioned people having a difficult time on equine rotation. I had a very easy equine rotation. It was in December and, and over the holidays, there wasn't anything going on. We had a couple of things we went out for, but it was pretty dead. And that was also by design. Not because, during foaling season, right? Exactly. Oh, um, so again, again, small animal tracker, not, and I mean, I, I grew up with horses. So I'm, I'm comfortable around them, which was a big difference between my large animal rotation and my equine rotations, you know, I grew up around horses and I can at least read them and know where to stand and where not to stand and how to handle them. But, which I didn't know for cows at all, but I still had no desire to practice equine medicine. So, but I remember distinctly there was one day we had a, a big snowstorm and you, you still have to get into the clinic. And I walked, I walked from school to the clinic that day. So wow. that's, that's how close I lived, which was, okay, okay. that was convenient. <laughs> huh. Well, that was very clever to schedule your equine rotation, not during foaling season. <laughs> yeah. What, what's funny is, so it wasn't during foaling season. There was, I remember there was one day I really enjoy um, theriogenology or repro. Mm -hmm. And there was one day that, they were doing a scheduled C-section on a golden retriever who was anticipated to have 12 plus puppies. Mm -hmm. And they were looking for extra hands to catch. And I had absolutely nothing to do on equine. So I went to the equine practitioners and said, please, 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 can I go catch puppies? <laughs> and they let me because there wasn't anything. We weren't doing anything. We had done rounds in the morning and there were no patients and no, no calls during the day. So I got to leave my equine rotation for a couple hours and go watch the C-section and catch puppies. Nice. Was that the first C-section that you'd seen or had you seen a bunch of them working with that? No, I had seen a lot in the other practice. Um, in particular, there was uh, an English Mastiff breeder that the practice I worked at in undergrad uh, worked with her. So I had actually seen um, surgical insemination and C-sections all, all the way timed, you know, timed plan C-sections. Mm -hmm. I, I had I, I got to do a lot in that practice. They, they definitely went a long ways to helping me get where I am, I think. That's great. That's great. Not everybody has that experience. Yeah, it, it helped. It, it helped tremendously my first year out as well because in it, fourth, fourth year is great. Your clinical rotation is great. But if you don't get a lot of good general cases on general practice, or if you don't get into a really good general practice for your third year external rotations, yeah. you don't see you don't see the regular stuff <laughs> on internal medicine. You see all of the weird stuff. You don't see, you know, on on neuro, you're generally not seeing your 
just barely ataxic back dogs. Mm -hmm. You're seeing the ones with no deep pain that need to be in surgery today. Mm -hmm. You're you're seeing the the more severe cases. You're not seeing your first time blocked cats or just the, oh, he threw up twice this morning. How do you work that one up? You're seeing chronic vomiting and diarrhea that's been on every medication under the sun. And I still learned a lot and still call back to some of the, the medications or treatments that we did, but it's not not really what you're going to see uh, that first year out if mm-hmm. you go straight into a general practice. Mm-hmm. Well, let me ask you this. Um, you, you mentioned that uh, working in that really busy general practice before veterinary school was so great for you and they were really supportive. They knew you wanted to go to vet school. And so they, they helped you, they coached you, they, they, they taught you about stuff. So were you, were you close to the veterinarians that worked there? And, and how did that relationship develop? Because the places where I worked um, to, to get my hours for vet school, and I just got the minimum, really just the minimum. So I went into vet school having a very hard time, uh, you know, knowing what they were talking about sometimes because I'd had so little experience in the clinic. And also, I mean, my job as a veterinarian assistant was like mop the floor, do the laundry. Mm -hmm. Hey, come hold this cat. So restraint was probably, you know, the most pertinent thing I did. And I got to see things done, but nobody was explaining to me, this is this medical condition, that medical condition, look at this radiograph, nothing like that. So did you get that kind of mentorship? I did. I did. And how, so, like, how did you, did you have to pursue that or was it just like that was the culture of the clinic where you worked? I think it was a little bit of both. I don't, I, I certainly don't think that the doctors would have invested as much time and explanation if I wasn't equally interested. Um, so there, I had gotten into this practice by way of another girl who was also at the time hoping to go to vet school that the pre-vet advisor at my undergrad knew. So it was kind of this, you know, oh yeah, I, I had talked to the pre-vet advisor because I want to go to vet school. What do I need to do? You need to work at a vet hospital, go talk to so-and-so she's working at this great practice and she wants to go to vet school. So she helped get me in. And, and initially I just worked, I think I worked every Saturday morning and you know, like Thursdays or something. So not a whole lot of hours initially, but yeah, they, they all knew that I wanted to go to vet school and, but it's, it's both. You've got to show the interest. So now on the veterinarian side, I, I enjoy teaching. I enjoy talking about cases and that aspect, but there's, there's gotta be that interest on the other side. If you're just going to stand there and be a wallflower, Mm -hmm. I'm not going to, I'm not going to carry the entire bit of the conversation and, and teach. So there, there was a little bit of both, but yeah, they, they taught me everything from restraint to reading fecals. I check clients into rooms and get TPRs. Mm-hmm. I learned to draw blood, place catheters, hold x-rays, monitor anesthesia <laughs> to do the best as I, I could at that point. Um, there was even one case I remember uh, we had, they were doing an exploratory on this dog that they believed had just a splenic mass. When we opened him up, uh, there was evidence there were metastases everywhere mm. in this dog's abdomen. Mm. So we ended up, we ended up euthanizing this dog on the table, but then that vet taught me how to suture wow. and she let me close. Mm-hmm. So I had actually had some instrument, not, you know, obviously not a lot, but a little bit of instrument handling before Mm -hmm. I got to third year and, you know, being terrified by Dr. Lance teaching us how to (laughs) suture. I was more terrified of the tech. I I did. (laughs) Well, I was terrified that I'd be outed as a lefty because, (sighs) as you know, as a doctor, Dr. Otto Lance, the surgeon is left-handed. Yes. And... I'm, I am left-handed. I write left-handed. I draw blood left-handed. I place catheters with my left hand. But growing up, I never had left-handed scissors. I've always held scissors and those scissor-type instruments in my right hand. I, I, I'm very uncomfortable having that same instrument in my left hand. It's just not... It would have been more learning. So I... I 
I suture and I, sur- I surgerize, as I say, uh, from the right-handed side of the table. Wow. So, so, so during your surgery course um, and the surgeries that we did, you did it as if you were right-handed and nobody ever knew the difference. Yes. <laughs> Good for you. That's amazing. I very, very very distinctly remember, uh, I think it was Kylie Wallowender, who was also left-handed. At one point, we were short on left-handed instruments, and she was like, oh, no, it's it's fine. I'll just do right-handed. And he was like, no, you are left-handed. You do it left-handed. And I was like, (laughs) yeah, put my hands behind my back. (laughs) And... uh, I just I'm I'm far more far more comfortable that that way. Mm-hmm. If if I have to, if I you know go if I have to, I can switch it. But obviously, then the lockbox is is reversed, so it's still more difficult. But mm-hmm. um, no, I'm I'm much I'm much more comfortable having my my needle drivers and and those types of instruments, scissors in my right hand. Well, then you are ambidextrous. <laughs> Congratulations. Only only sometimes cuz boy if you ask me to if you ask me to draw blood or place a catheter or do a cysto cystocentesis with my right hand I would struggle. Huh. It's amazing I though. Struggle. I mean so you you trained your right hand to do these tasks that you know theoretically should be very difficult and awkward but you've trained your 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 right hand to do that. So it's pretty amazing, you know, neuroplasticity or you know, what people can do when, when they need to. And you yeah. had just decided that it would just be more efficient to do it that way because you'd always used your right hand for scissors and other instruments. So you were just like, not going to bother with retraining <laughs> your left hand. <laughs> How interesting. But yeah. so back to, I just want to, because I want to give people an idea of maybe, I don't know, they can do a better job than I did as a veterinary assistant of getting the kind of experience and uh, mentoring, coaching, learning. Um, So it sounds like you got that, whereas I didn't. And I was, you know, I was, I wasn't shy, but I was always aware that the doctors were very busy. um, And I didn't want to slow them down. And I didn't want to be a burden. And I didn't want to ask them about things, even though I was really curious, because I had a feeling I wouldn't really understand the answers most of the time anyway. So I really wasn't very proactive as a veterinary assistant, and, and you were more so. But even at that really busy general practice, like, veterinarians are busy, you know? And uh, even, like, even for new graduates, I've seen practices where there's a brand new graduate and the other veterinarians in the practice don't have time to mentor them. So, so how did you finagle that, you know, as a, a pre-vet student to get, you know, all that uh, hands-on learning and mentoring? I don't, as that's the thing is, I don't remember doing anything specific, just being, being engaged and... Yeah, paying attention. I, I don't even. I don't really remember being like, "Oh, hey, why are you doing this?" But I would say, don't to two pre vet students. One, if you can get into a practice that already has another pre vet student or has had a pre vet student previously, mm-hmm. that's a good sign. Mm-hmm. But I think some of it comes down to just the culture of this practice. Absolutely. One of the one of the two owners, his son, is also a veterinarian. Mm-hmm. So one of the owners has had a child go to vet school. So Mm -hmm. I I think it's, I think some of it was the the culture of the practice, but I mean, don't, don't be afraid to ask. And even if it's just, why are we doing this? Or, you know, why are you worried about X? Mm -hmm. Um, If the, if the practice has a library or books on the shelf, look through them. Uh, There, there, I have a, a textbook that I still refer to now that I learned about because it was on their shelf (laughs) and I bought it and took it to vet school and I still have it and still use it. So, Yeah. I think part of it might be luck just ending up in the right practice with the right culture. Yeah. But like I said, the ways that you can increase that is if they've, you know, ask your pre-vet advisor, if if the school has one, a pre-med advisor, if there are practices that other students locally have worked at. Yeah. Yeah. Because that, that increases the likelihood of a culture that's 
conducive to that. Good, good advice. Okay, so um, after you graduated from vet school, um, your first job was in, um, was general practice, small animal general practice in Kentucky, right? Yes. Tell we, me about the the transition. Vet school. <laughs> Yeah, small animal veterinary general practice. Yay! Yeah. It was it was a big it was a big transition for some some un, for some expected reasons and some unexpected reasons. So the unexpected reasons being that my boss and I, I knew this at the time that I interviewed, but my boss had had a cerebellar stroke in oh. March of 2011. Oh and my. so we graduated in May of 2011. So he had been keeping the practice open and running using multiple relief veterinarians to right. fill all of those and keep the practice going. So come the middle of May, he was pretty desperate to have more full-time veterinarians. So he had hired both myself and another new grad. So he had two new graduates. In from Virginia class. Tech? From our class? No, um, myself and then the other girl uh, graduated from Western University. Okay, okay. And oh, there, there was a, and she, she had had more of an equine type background and you know, Western's teaching model is a little different from the other vet schools. Very different. I am really entirely- fascinated. This is so awesome because... <laughs> I was just, uh, I previously had interviewed um, a doctor who had gone to Western University and we talked a bit about problem-based learning and, you know, we both admitted like, I don't know if I was better off or you were better off. Like, how could we know? But you had the opportunity to work with somebody who had gone through that 100% problem-based learning curriculum, which scared the heck out of me. Um, So I'm really curious to hear like how you guys did together and what the differences were. Yeah, so we got along really well, which was nice. I'll be entirely honest, she struggled there. I mean, and some of this wasn't entirely her. She was very, very bright, and uh, she ended. She ultimately left the practice in November of that year, so only about six months. But I believe she went on to an internship and residency. So it's it's not for being. I mean, it's not for not being bright. She was clearly a very a very bright individual, but. There was not a lot of mentoring because, as I said, our boss had had a cerebellar stroke. And so while he was, that certainly didn't affect him in the way that a traditional cerebral stroke would, uh, he wasn't in the practice terribly often. It was just these relief veterinarians who, they didn't sign up for mentorship. (laughs) That's, That's not what they signed up for. So there wasn't a whole lot of mentorship to start with. Her prior background was predominantly equine and not small animal. Mm. And then there was the problem-based learning. So she, this is again, where having worked at that big, busy practice before really, really helped me because Mm. I had seen a lot of the quote unquote common things. Mm. I hadn't been the veterinarian at the time working them up. At least when they walked in the door, it wasn't completely foreign. Mm. I remember distinctly, you know, two, two incidences with her. I had some kind of urology case. I don't even remember what, what the patient was in for, but I remembered I've got Dr. Grant's notes and I know on what page of those notes I need to go to look up this piece of information that I'm, I'm searching for. And I, I pulled out, pulled out my spiral bound notes and flipped through and found it. And I remember her standing there looking over my shoulder saying, you have notes. I wish I had notes. All I had was textbooks. I didn't have any notes. So I really felt for her in that moment. Um, And then again, speaking of just not seeing the quote unquote normals or most common things in general practice. I remember at one point being in treatment and she carried this cat back and this cat had some oral lesions and her saying, Oh my goodness, I have no idea what this is. And just from across the room looked at it and said, you know, that's, it's an eosinophilic plaque, you know, do, do cytology or do biopsy, you look up there, you know, but most likely from across the room that looks like an eosinophilic plaque, which is not, you know, it's not some big complicated thing or, you know, it's not a zebra, but it just was something that she hadn't 
seen and hadn't gotten that exposure to. So it, it was not, I, I think she probably would have excelled in an environment with a lot of mentorship. Yeah, yeah. Especially yeah. if she was in a small animal environment with a lot of mentorship. It just was not not a good environment for her. For me, it definitely still was was tough and and let me <laughs> let me tell you it, it's it's funny how your head turns around the first time people start calling you Dr. Dunn like oh wait that's that's me <laughs> you're, you're <laughs> talking to me especially when the staff is all I'm I'm finally at a point in my career where I have staff that I am older than and that's refreshing as well <laughs> um it's it, it, it's tough to get out and you're a brand new grad and all of your staff is older than you and has been practicing for longer than you and you got to make that call and be in charge. And that's where I, I feel, again, that having had a pretty busy pre-vet experience helped give me just a little more confidence. And it ultimately ended up being a pretty decent first year because, you know, it was a little sink or swim. Mm-hmm. But I was able to practice pretty high quality medicine in, in this practice. I mean, we had digital x-ray, ultrasound, digital dental you know, we had a, a pretty affluent clientele that would do mm-hmm. what I recommended. Mm-hmm. So I got to do pretty thorough workups and felt that I was really practicing good medicine right out of school. So that, that helped tremendously. That's, that's great. Yeah. That's good here. You had a good experience. Okay. Yeah. So, so you actually had a pretty good experience at your first practice right out of school. Um, despite the fact that you're the owner of the practice couldn't practice and the relief vets weren't, they didn't really sign up for mentorship, but, um, so, but you basically had to, you had to draw on your past experience from before vet school at that, at that clinic and, and teach yourself a lot of this stuff. I, I did. Um, yeah. And knowing, knowing good books and having some, my, my fourth year rotations helped as well. I mean, obviously we had the in clinic. So for my, my two externals in fourth year, I did one external at the spay neuter clinic there in Christiansburg. So getting some hands on surgical experience, which really helped. I definitely highly recommend Oh yeah. If you can get an external spay and neuter clinic, do it. Absolutely, Absolutely do it because you are not going to get anywhere near enough in in vet school. I think I did two spays and half a neuter. Yeah. In vet school, I yeah. I really think that that's what I did. And again, some of that is I, I guess I could have done a couple more if I had taken that extra elective surgical class, but it would have uh-huh. literally been a couple. No, no. <laughs> yeah, not not that many more. <laughs> Again, in 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 the moment, it was oh darn, I'm not you know I'm not taking that class, and no, it doesn't. Mm, no, make make your own experiences. Get that spay neuter external, if you can get, and then if you can get a busy general practice, um, that would also be good. So I I did a general practice three week rotation, also close to the vet school. I can't remember, but. She was she was a pretty fearless vet. I enjoyed working with her because, yeah, she would do a lot herself. We we opened this um, Great Pyrenees that had really really high liver values, but we couldn't figure out why, and we ended up doing an explore. And I remember we're fishing around in this dog's abdomen and pick up a rock. And we're like, what is this? And then as we migrate north and migrate north, everything becomes more and more orange the further north we go. And this dog oh. had gallbladder stones and had ruptured her oh gallbladder. Oh my gosh. So he and had mild peritonitis. Did he? We we ultimately ended up euthanizing yeah. that dog on the table. It was oh. um but but that was, but you know, we, we did that at one point. I helped her with a, a splenectomy for a, a giant tumor. It was, you know, here's, here's your hemostat, here's your pack of suture. You start on this end and I'll start on this end. And we did it together. Wow. Yeah. Um, I did, I did a pericardiosynthesis nice. at that practice. Nice. Uh, but some of that, I actually did that one. She had not, she wasn't going to do it. She had not done one. I had seen several at this practice I worked at before school. And, you know, if, if everybody's on board, we've got ultrasounds and I'm willing to give it a shot and we did it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So 
it was, and I'll say, I mean, that practice, I also, obviously there's ethics and people have different opinions. I'll be honest. I would rather not ever do one again, but I did declaws there as well, Uh which is again, not something you're going to get in vet school, but something that does still exist out there in general practices. Mm -hmm. And my, the practice I worked at my first year out did do declaws. So it was ultimately helpful that I had already done those Mm -hmm. before I got out and was doing them completely on my own. I had done them with another veterinarian before I'll be happy to, I'll I'll never do one again. I'm done with that. (laughs) But, but again, something that you're not going to get in vet school. So yeah, spay neuter clinic, a busy general practice. If you have the option for either another rotation or just ever dental, that would also be the next one would be you are not, you're not going to get really anything dental wise and dentistry is hard. Oh, it's so hard. Again, there's there's reasons that I love emergency medicine. (laughs) Um, I would be happy if I never have to do a dental ever again. I'm actually covering two general practice relief shifts next week and uh, no dentals was on my my list of I, I will do I will do other things I'll see all appointments but do not schedule any dentals for me my, my own dog had dentistry a couple of weeks ago I sent her to one of my colleagues practices just I, I don't I don't enjoy it some people really do but I think a lot of I, I've got a lot of the concepts in my head I know what I know what needs to be done mm-hmm. but it's again it's hands-on it's actually doing it it's having good instruments which I think is sometimes oh, a yeah. problem good equipment. Not having good yeah. good instruments yeah and radiology so, dental radiology yeah yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> So um, I, I think I that, mean, yeah, if you can get zero you can get I mean, dentistry oh, experience before you graduate. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Maybe mm-hmm. you could even do like a rotation at a, um, a board certified you know, dentist's office or hospital because we got, I think we had one lab and I removed one tooth from a cadaver. Yep. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's such a steep learning curve. There is so much to know. There's a reason why, you know, dentists are not the same as MDs. <laughs> you right. know? Yeah, that's exactly right. But I will say that even if you don't get that experience, there are a lot of veterinarian dental CE opportunities yes. out there. I think because of that, you whether it's at mm-hmm. the big national groups where, you know, they will have cadavers and it's, you know, here's how you do this flap or this tooth or, and, you know, it'll be four or eight hours of dentistry all day long. Mm-hmm. So those, those opportunities, there, there are multiple dental CE opportunities out there yeah. if you don't get that in fourth year. But if you can get it in fourth year before you're the responsible party as a new grad, mm-hmm. that's, uh, that's definitely to, to your benefit. So. Yeah. Cause if you're going into general practice, that's going to be, that's, a, I mean, it's, it's, it's a big part of general practice, like a, you know, business model. And yeah. But it, I, you know, not to hate on dentistry, although I think I do hate it. <laughs> but um, some people really love it, and I think the better mm-hmm. you get at it, the more you like it. And you know, in my last year before we moved here to Flagstaff, I was actually getting kind of good at it, and to my surprise, found I, I wasn't hating it, and might have been enjoying it a little bit. So it is something that uh, it's a, it's a difficult skill, it's a difficult skill set, but if you're persistent. Um, you can get good at it, and uh, it can be enjoyable. So, yeah, I think that I think that if I'd had more of the hands-on proficiency, because like I said the the book knowledge and all was was there. I I remember my my first year out, I did X-rays on this little Boston Terrier, and she had an unerupted lower first premolar, and she had a massive dentigerous cyst incorporating her canine and the first three premolars. I wasn't going to touch fixing that (laughs) with a 10 foot pole because I was afraid I'd break this poor dog's jaw because the wall was so thin, but I still recognized it, knew exactly what it was, knew intellectually what needed to be done, Mm -hmm. but didn't really feel that I had the skill set 
to do it. Right. So, and I, I feel that way just about, to be honest about a lot of general dentistry. It's, I, I've got a lot of the mental knowledge in terms of what it is and what to do, right. at least for what you're going to see in general practice, but the, the hands-on proficiency is, mm. is not there. <laughs> In the case that you described, though, I think that even somebody who, who felt pretty confident in general dentistry might refer that one because of the, of the fear of actually breaking the yeah. jaw. That's, that's something that you, I think you want an expert to work on something like that. But, um, okay, and then... Yeah, uh, it, was, it was pretty impressive. So. Yeah. Um, so then you just were there for one year, and then you decided to... So you moved, right, to New Hampshire... Was that for your husband's job? It did. It did. And then you decided, when you moved to New Hampshire, why did you decide to go into ER rather than into general practice again? Well, I did go into general practice initially. I did a year of general practice in Manchester, New Hampshire. So it, we really just, in Kentucky, I was practicing in Lexington, Kentucky, which is 500,000, 750,000 people city. I grew up in rural Maryland. We just, I, I didn't enjoy being there. There were some cultural things that did as, as my boss reintegrated into the practice, there, there were some cultural things there as well that were not going to make it a good long-term fit. So we just, I'm, I'm a veterinarian. I can practice anywhere, you know? So we just sort of picked and ended up in Manchester, New Hampshire, and at another general practice. It was technically a corporate owned general practice by a much smaller, uh, I can't even, pet partners is what it was at the time. It previously used to be something else. When, when it was just me and the other doctors in the practice, it was great. Uh, I got to practice very, you know, we, we again had digital dental and digital radiology. Uh, we did not have ultrasound, but, you know, we still had that. It was, it was also nice. My, my job, my first year out, I also had to take call. Oh, wow. My job, my first year out, which, you know, there's an emergency hospital literally five minutes down the road. Again, no. this gets into the cultural, it gets into the cultural thing. Oh, we wanted to keep all no. of the emergencies <laughs> in-house. So, oh. yeah, I, I, still, I still have some PTSD when I hear somebody's cell phone go off that is the same ringtone that I had. Um, that's another thing I hope to never do in my life is take call. I can't stand being on call. It's, mm. it's a drain on your quality time. It's a drain on your family time. Mm -hmm. It's just not, not something I enjoy. And I would, I would caution anyone that is taking call, especially young female people that are taking call, there, there's some safety concerns there as well. Mm. Uh, I remember distinctly getting called in for an ataxic basset hound that ended up being a disc. So I met the owner at the clinic, looked at the dog, said, this is probably a disc. You know, we do conservative management. You can go to Louisville and have surgery. He ultimately opted to take the dog for surgery. I found out a couple of weeks later that this particular gentleman is on the sex offender list. <gasps> And I was in that building alone with him. Alone with him. Oh my god. Yes. So, yeah, yeah. There, there's some there's some safety concerns regarding taking I, call, uh -uh. and people don't people don't think about that. I don't think so. Yeah. There, that's that's another aspect. So from from then on, anytime I took call, my husband came with me and sat in the lobby while I saw patients. So, so this, this new practice in Manchester did not take a call, which was nice because there was an emergency hospital down the road. But what I soon realized was that I'm, I was missing out on working up cases. Even if I got something in late in the day, even if it's not something that's that bad, it's a, it's a blocked cat. It's a pruned out old kidney cat. It's mm -hmm. a dog with pancreatitis. Mm -hmm. It was okay. He needs further treatment. Go over there. Yes. I didn't get to keep or finish working up these patients. Right. And that was a real letdown to me. Uh, uh, there were a couple of things that I really stayed very late to do just so that I could get the experience. I did, I did my first gastronomy ever after hours just because I hadn't done one yet. 
and I wanted to do one. Um, and I did my first fee section that way as well. It was uh, that in that particular case, there was only one puppy and that puppy was non-viable. So oh. that was also nice that there wasn't the urgency of getting these puppies out ASAP. It was, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to get it out, but I'm going to take my time and make sure that I feel comfortable with this surgery. Mm -hmm. But again, that was another case that potentially could have been referred immediately for surgery. Mm -hmm. And I stayed until 10 o'clock at night so that I could do the surgery and make sure that the animal was recovering before going home. Huh. So I missed getting the, my cases through. Yeah. And so a couple of things happened. It was a little bit on a whim. I sent my resume to the emergency hospital where I'm at. They didn't have an ad. It was just on a whim going to send it to them. It also coincided with, I was pregnant again at that point. And, uh, Let's see. So I sent my resume the beginning of August and I was maybe in July, probably the beginning of July. I was due to give birth at the end of August. So I was out to here at, at the time that I interviewed for that job. And what what's funny is what ha what ended up happening is I sent them my resume in the morning and that afternoon they had already been planning to post an ad. So it was very serendipitous that the ad yep. in my resume came on the same day. And I interviewed, I interviewed within two weeks or so, and they made me the job offer the night before I ended up going into labor with my daughter. Good so timing. That, it really, it really was. So I got the job offer on a Tuesday night, woke up Wednesday morning, went into labor, had my daughter by lunchtime, and uh, <laughs> sent them an email back Wednesday night accepting the offer. So... And how long and after having your daughter uh, was it before you, you started working again? About six weeks, the beginning of October. Okay, okay. But that's, and ultimately that was kind of nice for the general practice too, because they were already anticipating me being out for six weeks. So they were all, you know, they're already aware that they were going to be down a doctor and I just turned my maternity leave into my notice. Mm -hmm. It took about six weeks, and then I started at the ER clinic um, the beginning of October 2013. So I'm coming up on five years this fall. I've wow. been at the same practice. And were, were you doing overnights? I was, yes. Initially, initially I was doing exclusively overnights. Mm -hmm. hmm. And at that point, uh, my, my husband at the time was being a stay-at-home, so he was home with the kids. Wow. So your husband wasn't, was not working? He was not, no. You were the sole support for your family? Yes. Wow. Oh, uh, yeah. that's, I mean, okay. My, like veterinarians <laughs> don't make that much money. That's, that's yeah, it was... a bit of a stretch. I mean, these days, <laughs> with, you know, if it was 30 years ago and you didn't have any student loan debt, then yeah, you could support a family of four on a veterinarian salary. But with loans and repayments the way they are now, how did you manage? How did you manage that? And if I'm being entirely honest, I didn't handle the finances at that point in my marriage. So, okay, okay. But we we got by. We got by. I'll be entirely honest. A okay. lot of the specifics and ins and outs, and okay. yeah. So <laughs> your husband was managing the finances, and you had enough money to pay the bills, and and everybody got enough to eat, and the rent was paid, and all that. Mm -hmm. Wow, he's he's yep. he must have been good at it. If it had been me, <laughs> there would not be enough money by the middle of the month. Oh gosh. Yeah, well, if I mean, if I mean, there, there were there were important and crucial things that we were not doing, like health insurance and saving for retirement. Wow! Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, this is something that that really um, concerns me about veterinary medicine is that you know most practices are, are are small, privately owned practices. They can't offer health insurance. They probably don't offer an uh, a retirement plan. So the 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 ER where you're working now, do they 
do they have health insurance? Do they have a retirement plan? Did they not when you first started, but now they do? Because I actually um, interviewed the, I don't know what his title is, I can't remember, but Dr. Timothy Hunt, such yes, a wonderful is. man. Uh, he so, is. Yeah, he's fantastic. So he's, he's been with us two or three years now and has really made some great positive changes. He's the COO, so the Chief Operating Officer. COO. Okay. So I interviewed him. He's uh, episode 15. So he's the chief operating officer of several different hospitals, one of which is the ER where you work. So when you first started, was there no health insurance or? No, there, there was. <laughs> that, was not, that was not entirely my decision to not have health insurance. And so. Oh. Okay. Wow. Wow. Well, I mean, so, you know, we, we can, we can tiptoe around this if you want, or, you know, we can, it's completely up to you, but, um, in 2013 is when you transitioned to ER and you were doing nights, you were the sole support for a family of four. And then in 2016, you got divorced. So was the job as an e overnight ER doctor, a strain on your marriage? No, it was entirely separate and and cultural might be the best word for it. It would take quite a lot to describe what it went into, but I, I can confidently say that veterinary medicine and my job had nothing to do with it. Okay. So that that part, at least, it, it was not a strain or, or an effect on my marriage. It was... It was purely between the two of us and a, a massive cultural difference. So, uh, yeah, I moved out September 23rd, 2014. So my kids were five and 13 months oh at that God. time. Wow. And I was very fortunate. My parents helped me tremendously. And uh, it now they were in Maryland. Final. They were. They were did at the they, time. Did they come out and, and, and stay with you and... Wow. Yeah, they did. Initially, they, they came up and helped me get a place and get settled in. They came, they, they've, they've been absolutely amazing. Um, yeah, they, they've been phenomenal. So I, I could not, I, I honestly don't know if I could have done it without them. I, I think that I might have left, I think I probably potentially would have gone back initially. It would have either taken me longer or uh, I wouldn't have made as a clean a break as, mm -hmm. as I needed to make. Mm -hmm. So they've, they've been absolutely amazing. So, and yeah, it, it was, it's been interesting since then. Um, and the, the divorce was final in January of 2016. Congratulations. So, just a little over two years now. Thank you. I appreciate <laughs> when people say that. Note, note for everyone in society, if somebody says I'm getting divorced, please don't have the first thing you say be I'm sorry. Because for some of us, it's the best decision we've ever made. Um, <laughs> so just say, how are you doing? <laughs> so, mm hmm, mm -hmm. Well, I know um, that um, in your case, congratulations are in order. I know that you're much happier now. And so congratulations. <laughs> but um, so your parents came you. out, they helped you find a place. Um, and then uh, did, did they stay there or, or how did you, how did you work out? Like, uh, like you're still working as a full-time veterinarian. Your kids are young. So, so how are you working out? Who's taking care of them while you're, while you're working? How does that work? Okay. Yeah. So they, they stayed for the first week, I think. And so we've had pretty, pretty close to 50, 50 shared co-parenting since I moved out. So essentially when I'm at work, my kids are with him. Oh, I actually okay. have, I, I actually have very, very little by way of childcare or childcare expenses because of that Sometimes that's a little rough because I'm always either at work or with my kids. Um, I don't get much in the way of, of downtime otherwise. Right. But yeah, I don't have to pay for, for child care. Occasionally, um, yeah, they'll go have an overnight with friends or I have a, a babysitter that'll come and, and stay for the overnight, which is not inexpensive. Mm -hmm. So I try to make it, I try to make it on shifts where it's a, a shift that is above and beyond my normal contracted number 
because then I'm paid as if that's a, a relief shift. Right. So at least then I'm getting extra income. Otherwise, it would be a pure drain on on my finances mm. as just straight childcare. So, but that's that's the way it, it's worked, and it kind of worked out that way because as I said, my husband was staying home. So he didn't have a job and didn't have a schedule. So when it comes down to deciding when are the kids going to be where and what's going to take priority, I have a weird schedule. Yes. But of the two of us, I have a schedule. Mm-hmm. So our, our parenting schedules have always been crafted around my work schedule. So I've been fortunate in that regard. I've also been fortunate that Let's so six months, I think, after I moved out. I can't remember. But when uh, the prior medical director became a uh, boarded emergency criticalist and moved on to bigger and better things, um, I stepped up into the medical director role. And that was probably six months or a year after I moved out. So that helped, too, because now I'm in charge of the schedule <laughs> at work. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I want it to be fair and I try very hard to make the I'm, schedule fair to everyone. I'm but at the same time, if you know, there's a particular night that it's easier for me to pick up one or, you know, oh, I kind of need to move this one, I have a little more freedom to do that. <laughs> so that that's helped. Nice. So um let's talk about the promotion. Um as, as medical director, are you still doing the same number of ER shifts and just adding on another, you know, eight hours for administrative work? Uh, how does it work? So initially, I just kept my, my normal number of shifts. So the practice that I work at is nights, weekends, holidays. So we're not, we're not open during the day. We're not okay. open eight to five, basically Monday to Friday, we are closed. Okay. And we're very, we're very highly seasonal. Um, we're in the lakes region of New Hampshire. So in the summer, we're crazy busy. We will, we will do as much money in the 4th of July weekend as we do the entire month of February. So there, there was, there can be nights, 15 hour overnights where there's a fair amount of downtime. So I was able to, to, you know, review charts and do things like that at that point. My, my contract has changed now to where I am working one less shift than previous, but with the addition of eight to 12 hours every two weeks of administrative time in the hospital. So mm-hmm. that's, that's the, the little difference now where I actually have dedicated time in the office where mm-hmm. there's not also the potential for patients. So I would imagine that would be crucial, you know, to, yeah. to rather it, than it just is. saying, yeah, you're the medical director and somehow you're going to get all this medical director <laughs> duty done. I don't know when, but just, you just need to do it. So they're actually yeah. taking into account, oh, hey, guess what? This stuff takes time. We'll say, you know, it's, it's 12 hours and, and, and we'll account for that in your schedule. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's nice. It's been, it's been, it will get much easier in the fall. So my, my daughter will actually be five in the fall, which is crazy. My, my children will be nine and five in the fall. So that means kindergarten and it is all day kindergarten here. And boy, mom can't wait. So <laughs> <laughs> one of the, the it's, it, it is help. It is, helpful to have that dedicated office time, but it's also a little bit tricky because when I'm not working and have my kids, my daughter still isn't in school full time yet. Mm -hmm. So she does go to full day preschool on Tuesdays and Thursdays. Mm -hmm. But then if I spend all of that time in the office, then I don't have, you know, hey, I'd like to do laundry or run errands or just enjoy a couple of hours of non-kid time. Right. I, I don't get that. So that, that I anticipate. So sometimes now it's really chopped up. Like I did, you know, an hour and a half this morning and I did 45 minutes the other day. It's really chopped up because that's just the time that I happen to have mm-hmm. that's kid free or I'll bring them with me and or bring her with me in particular and turn on a movie for a little bit. But you can still only occupy her for so long for, you know, about two hours or so is the max. So my time is really chopped up. So I'm looking forward in the fall when they're both in school 
eight to three, Monday to Friday, <laughs> then it'll be much easier to get into the office for a good chunk of time and, you know, and do four hours at one block and, and be a little bit more focused on some of these big projects that we've been kicking around. So hmm. almost yeah. there, light at yeah. the end of the tunnel. You're going to have some, you're going to have some time for yourself. After mm -hmm. years, <laughs> years of not having, I can, I can put them on the, I can put them on the bus in the morning and go back to bed. <laughs> If or I choose, want to. you know, go take a bubble bath or go get a mm -hmm. massage. Have an uninterrupted cup of coffee or, oh. yeah. <laughs> so, I mean, there, there are, you know, I, I work 12 or 15 hour shifts. So they're, they're rough, but I'm, I'm contracted to do five in a two week period. Now, when you work an overnight, you tend to lose a portion of the day before and a portion of the day after so that you can rest and flip but still, that's, that leaves me with a lot of days where I'm, I'm home. Like I said, you know, I've got 50-50 parenting. And when, when I'm home, when I have my kids, I, I get to be a little bit of a stay-at-home mom. Mm. I, I never worry if my daughter is sick at school, who's going to pick her up? Mm -hmm. if, it's, if it's my day, I'll go get her because I'm not, I'm not working at 11 o'clock in the morning Right, right. on, on, on my day. I'm not working. Yeah. Uh, I don't worry about scheduling doctors or dentist appointments. You know, we can go to library story time in the morning. We can go to play group at the community center. So yeah. it, it's, it, it, it's not certainly not easy. And there are days where I'm super tired, but I also get a fair amount of, you know, really hands-on, like I said, stay-at-home mom kind of time mm -hmm. when I have them. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that I, I love about ER. I mean, I think, I think ER medicine is much more interesting um, and there's no dentistry. <laughs> but also, you know, the schedule in ER, you, you know, you, you might work three 12-hour shifts a week or like you, you work, you know, five 12 to 15-hour shifts. Uh, one week and then you have the next week off. So I just feel like even though ER is, I mean, the schedule is often uh, very variable. It changes all the time. Um, so it's not a set schedule. It's not predictable, but it gives you more space to have some balance. And I remember when I transitioned from ER to general practice and it sounded like it was going to be great because I was only working four days a week and then every other Saturday um, for six hours. But those four days, like they were just as long as my ER shifts, and if not longer, and uh, so incredibly exhausting. And, and you couldn't do anything else with that time. And it was every single week, right? So um, there was no room left yeah. over. To, to go to the library or, you know, do these things that you talk about, take your kids to the doctor, like that was just impossible. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, I prefer ER if I had to choose. But yeah. how, like, okay, so you get home from an overnight. Yeah, and if you have to move shit around, and, and if you have to move things around, you, you don't even necessarily always have to take time off to take time off. Right. I, this, this current week is, New Hampshire has February and April vacation where the kids get an entire week off from school at the end of February and again at the end of April. Um, again, 50-50 parenting. We alternate years. I have February this year. He has April this year. And the next year we switch. So I have the kids this entire week when they're off from school. So I worked four nights in a row last week and I'm working, which is Three, three is okay. Four gets to be rough. That cool. was last, last week was rough, especially because we, we were very slow Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday. We were nuts all night long. <laughs> Friday was really rough, but it meant, and then I'm working this coming Saturday. So that close that encapsulates this pay period is four days last week, Saturday this week. But that means that I've been off this entire week. I've been off and at home. Mm -hmm. And I haven't taken any pay time. I haven't taken any PTO. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So right. it, it makes it to where, yeah, you know, depending on where your shifts fall, you can take just one or two of your PTO days and potentially have seven to 10 days off. 
Yes. Yes. Depending exactly. on how things depending on how things fall. And you mentioned the the regularity. We we have a rot we do have a rotating schedule. It rotates four week blocks. Yeah, every four weeks. But so it's it's regularly irregular. Oh, so it's actually predictable for you. We really try. Yeah. Right. You know, there, there are some, there are some things that move around. Like I said, last week and this week are kind of a mess because it's accommodating me having my kids this week, mm. but ultimately, yeah, it's, it's on a four week rotation so that, yeah, you know, this, this weekend you do day shifts next weekend, you do night shifts the next weekend you're off. And then the next weekend you do nights and then you've got, you know, a spattering of shifts in the middle of the week as well. So it, trying to have it be as regular as it as it can be because you know just because it's er doesn't mean we can't still try to pay attention to that quality of life it matters that you know the things that are going to burn people out are yeah not being able to take time off or not having any way to plan their schedule yeah that that will absolutely burn people out so yeah. as much as we can we also try to organize um holidays as equitably as we can. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so three, three major holidays in the summer, Memorial day, 4th of July, labor day. Um, when we're, when we're fully staffed, we have three full-time doctors. So ideally we would try to give each one of those off, mm -hmm. but you could still enjoy it. And the same thing for Thanksgiving, Christmas, and new year's yeah. so that you can have at least one of those off while you're working the other two, because yeah. it is, you know, you're going to have to work nights, weekends, and holidays in ER. But if we can finagle it to where you are off, you know, our, our, we hired a doctor last July. And so this past Christmas, I worked Thanksgiving and he worked Christmas. And this year, I'm going to try and, and flip it. And again, some of that comes down to my parenting schedule as well, yeah. that we yeah. alternate Thanksgiving and Christmas. Mm -hmm. But try to be as equitable as I can. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, tell me about your, your position as medical director. And, you know, what are some of the most interesting things that, that this role uh, requires of you? And what are some of the most challenging things this role requires of you? So I would say the things that I do on a mo the most regular basis is I do, I try to review every chart for every case that that people see, even if it's just a quick skim to be like, okay, you know, this is, we're not, that, that we're offering blood work where we should be offering blood work. And if we're offering x-rays that we're also recommending a radiologist review that we're not, um, you know, boxing cats down or doing, doing things that we don't even own a box, but if, if we did, um, trying, trying to make sure that the medicine is, is reasonably appropriate. We don't have, you know, treatment protocols. This is how you work this up because medicine is a practice and everybody does things a little bit differently. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm fine if, if you want to induce with ketamine midazolam and I'm going to induce with propofol as long as that's appropriate for your patients and they were adequately monitored, I'm not going to intervene in that. Mm -hmm. But if you place a urinary catheter in that cat, I want to see that you recommended an x-ray afterwards to mm -hmm. know that it's in the right spot. Mm -hmm. So trying, trying to make sure that we're not missing things that we're keeping up on that. Um, I mean, and I, I find that interesting because I get to see what everybody else is seeing. It's, it's interesting in that I, I work with these other doctors, but at the same time, I don't. I never work another shift with these doctors. So it's also the only way that I have to, to see the medicine that they're practicing. But also I get to see the cases that they're seeing because sometimes we see some crazy things. We had, we had a, you know, I'm in New Hampshire and it was January. So it's rather chilly. Uh, we had a heat stroke dog a couple of weeks ago. And it was a lesson in how brachycephalics are not meant to be alive. <laughs> Um, um, the of French, course it was. French bulldog. Oh, of course it was. Dang it. Yes. <laughs> so oh the, the, owner had, the owner had run into the store, run into the house or something, and left the dog in the car with the heat running for, I, I don't even recall how long it was, but the dog somehow got himself trapped underneath of the front car seat right in front of the heat vent. Oh, my God. 
so he can't breathe to start with. And then he had this hot air on his face. Um, and so, yeah, he came in and he was like 108 degrees in January in New Hampshire. <laughs> so, but I didn't see that case, you know, and another veterinarian did and worked it up and treated it. And so I, I like that I get to see yeah. these other cases as well, even if I'm not actually the one that took it. So we're currently trying to work on a couple of other things. I had a cat recently that was brought in by a local fire department. There was a house that burned down. Unfortunately, the occupant was deceased, mm. but there they found a cat there. And she, you know, she had some, she had all, all her little whiskers were burnt off and her fur was all singed, her little paw pads. But while the firefighters were here with her, they said, you know, we have no idea what to do when we get in these situations. So we're trying to work on some very basic EMT type training to offer to the local fire department so that, because we, we get some calls on things like this. We had a, we, so we had that one. We had a dog recently, um, again, lesson in buckling your pets up in your car, buckle your dogs in. Um, we had, there was the car crash just down the street from us. The car wasn't going that fast. The human occupant only suffered a broken ankle. I think it was, but the dog was not restrained and became a projectile and fractured her pelvis. Oh. Um, oh. really, really severely she was we were not able we ultimately elected euthanasia for her but again this was something that we weren't the first people on the scene and the owner went to the hospital so it was the the police and the first responders that brought this pet to us so you know i'm I'm working on just some really basic okay here's how you can very basic assess these. Here's how you can restrain, um, assume everything might have rabies so you don't get bit. <laughs> so wow. trying, trying to work on that and trying to work on some basic standards of care for the hospital too. So that's kind of the That is the really interesting, interesting though, you portion. know. I never thought about it, you know, yeah. like uh, fire, firemen, firewomen, or people who drive ambulances, first responders. Do they have any training in pets? I guess not. And how helpful that would that be, you know? Yeah. That's fascinating. Yeah. In general, in general, not. And sometimes it depends on the state, you know, so obviously in both of those instances, the first responders transported the animals to us. Sometimes it depends on the state as well. In Massachusetts, they're not allowed to. Um, the first responders aren't allowed to transport animals. So what happens to they, the animals? But if they're there, but it, well, then that's even more crucial where if you're the person, if they're on the scene with that animal, for them to know some very basic things to do on the scene until another you know, family member or friend or somebody can transport it to the emergency hospital because there's pretend, the potential for some delay there. So working on that, mm. you know, just some real, real, mm. real basic mm -hmm. stuff. Um, I would say the the least enjoyable is all of the the human related stuff. So now, yes, I was going to ask you about this because Dr. Hunt, who is the COO, um, you know, I, I thought well maybe because it seems like he he does a lot of that stuff, so maybe yeah. you don't have to do as much, but you still. So, have yeah, it's it's a nice little it, it's a nice blend and that you know I don't own the practice. I don't, you know, a lot of the the big management things, you know, are we going to offer health insurance and what health insurance and negotiate like none of that is my problem. Mm -hmm. And I like I like that. Um, you know, ordering and finances and that's you know, I, I keep tabs on ACTs or average client transactions for my doctors so that I, you know, that reflects the medicine that we're offering. But some of that other big stuff is not my responsibility. And even right now, we're, um, we have a position open for a doctor. The initial resumes and interviews go to him first. And when he has a candidate that may be a good fit, then we all sit down together, the practice manager, myself and Tim, would all interview this, in, this individual together. So, but yeah, you know, it's, it's the HR stuff when we have, uh, you know, a, a patient that didn't get the level of medicine that we would like for them to have gotten, addressing that with them, whether or not it rises to the level of needing the actual disciplinary procedures or having somebody written up or something. That's, mm -hmm. that's no fun. That's not, mm -hmm. that's not enjoyable. Um, 
And ultimately, when something goes wrong or if a client is unhappy, the mm -hmm most often the buck stops with me. Mm -hmm. um, if a client calls and is unhappy, it falls to me to review that record and then make a plan and call the client and discuss the case. Mm -hmm. I'll say that we've worked as, as a practice, we've worked very, very hard in the last two years and we've had minimal um, complaints of any kind over the last two years. I mean, probably 10 or less in two years mm -hmm. complaints. If we've worked very, very hard on client communication and mm -hmm. how we present estimates and address finances yeah. and, and all of that. So that's been, that's been really helpful, but still when those things come in and unless it's a case that I saw, generally I'm the one that, that calls and, and deals with it and addresses it with the client, which is, also not terribly fun. <laughs> hmm. Well, so it sounds like, and, and my, um, my suspicion has always been that the majority of difficulties that we have with clients, client complaints are due to a breakdown in communication that yeah. most people are reasonable, but the reason we end up, you know, they end up getting angry is because they didn't understand what was going on. It wasn't well enough explained or it, you know, it, 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 they weren't treated in, in, in a way that would have made them feel more valued or whatever. So it, most of it comes down to our, our abilities to work with people and communicate with people. And most people are reasonable. Yeah, absolutely. And I, tell this to the staff, I say it to clients sometimes, nope, working at ER, nobody wants to come see me. Nobody, like even, even if it's just for an ear infection, it's Sunday afternoon in July, you want to be on your boat out on the lake. Mm -hmm. You have, you don't want to be here coming in to see me. So even in the, the easy cases, people are coming in a little bit miffed with the fact that they have to do this on a Sunday afternoon. Sure. And, and that's the easy stuff. That's not the two o'clock in the morning, you know, my dog collapsed case where now there's a lot of fear and it's a life, you know, a life threatening situation. So you really have to work very hard to be compassionate and, you know, leave any potential judgment or whatever, leave, leave it in treatment room. I, I don't, I'm, I'm not going to deny that every, everybody has those thoughts of, well, why didn't you come in sooner? And, but Ultimately, it doesn't matter because they're here right now and you have to deal with what's here right now. Mm -hmm. Yes, maybe you fuss with each other out back far away in quiet voices mm. about, <laughs> about some of these other nuanced aspects about the case. Mm. But when you walk in that room, it, it's acting sometimes. It really is. You've got to stand on the outside of that room and put on a good face. Mm -hmm. and go in there and smile and introduce yourself and shake their hand and do everything that you can to take what is an unpleasant situation, even if it is an ear infection on a Sunday afternoon, and make it as, as pleasant can be for, for whatever reason they're in. Mm -hmm. So it, it's, it's really, really important. Mm -hmm. And Especially when we get to when we're discussing, you know, end of life things and, and euthanasia is again, you know, it's emergency. We do a lot of euthanasia. I really, really try hard to have those be, quote, good experiences because people are going to remember that very oh, vividly, their last moments with their pet. Yeah. So it, it needs to be with the utmost of care and respect and, you know, kindness considering what, what they're in, even if, yeah, they've waited three weeks to bring their cat in. In this moment, it needs to be peaceful and respectful. And they need to walk out that front door, mm -hmm. carrying only the sadness that their pet is gone and nothing else. Right. Not, not feeling bitter because they felt judged by Absolutely. the animal hospital employees. I mean, I remember before I went to vet school and um, I, uh, I, I was at a veterinary hospital. Um, I, I think I was taking my dog there and I mentioned something to the receptionist about my cat peeing in the house. And she, she was just like, well, you need to bring him in. Uh, like just so judgmental <laughs> and like, that's not helpful. And when I first started as an ER vet, you know, of course, 
Like, did we get any training in how to like manage support staff or like what best practices are in terms of dealing with human? No, no, no. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, when I started in the ER, what would happen is the techs would come back and and they would tell me, of course, they they would have gotten the the TPR and everything, and they would give me a brief history. But they would also pepper their comments with their own personal opinions about the people in the room. Yeah. But they, they frequently colored my perceptions of clients before I even walked in the room. Yeah. And I mean, it's, and in that case, it's, you know, if you feel it's over the line, yeah, it's, but unfortunately, yeah, it's the veterinarian's place to say, which is tough sometimes to your support staff to say, that doesn't matter right now. And you've got to sometimes just walk away it helps as well in terms of closing that down. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it's interesting how you can, I, I actually take <clears throat> that I don't always enjoy going into some of those rooms, but when you walk out of that room and you've made a connection with that client, it's a really good feeling. It is. Uh, I had a client, I had a client pretty recently that the dog had some kind of wound on its face and, waited multiple days to bring the dog in and it was a family member that had pressured him to bring the dog in and oh by the way he'd given the dog three or four doses of naproxen oh, God. in those couple of days while he waited to bring the dog in mm. so you know this this was a room that on the surface was like this is not going to go well we're going to go into this room and this is not going to go well but you know the, the wound was fine the wound was granulating in I don't know what it was from but it was fine. You know, we'll give you some antibiotics for that. And, you know, by the way, we should really probably at least get, you know, your dog's fine and hasn't had any vomiting or any other outward effects of that naproxen. But we really probably should at least do a little chem 10. Mm -hmm. Let's get a picture of, of what our blood work looks like. And, you know, presented this gentleman with this estimate. And, oh, yeah, by the way, the dog hadn't been to the vet since it was adopted. So it was also not up to date on vaccines. So, you know, pre presented the, this owner with this, this estimate. And I think I put a rabies vaccine on there. And he asked, oh, well, is, is this blood work going to look for heartworms and Lyme disease? And I said, no, it's not. But if you want to do it, we can. Mm -hmm. And we did. Mm -hmm. So, you know, we, we ended up doing more for this dog, mm -hmm. even than what he came in for. And this owner was happy. We knew that this dog, you know, this dog now had a rabies vaccine, was heartworm negative, was Lyme or Lachia and a plasma negative, mm -hmm. was on antibiotics for the little thing on its face, miraculously. <laughs> All of the blood work was normal. Oh, thank goodness. <laughs> I, don't, I don't even know. But, but this guy was super happy and friendly. And if yeah. we had gone into that room with any sort of judgment yeah. about, well, why did you wait? Well, you know, we should have seen him a couple of days ago. And, yeah. you know, I can't believe you gave naproxen or whatever. It was really just, okay, you've already done it. So there's nothing we can do about it. But please don't do it again. <laughs> Right. And he was, and he was fine, and he was, yeah. he was absolutely fine. But yeah. that that entire encounter could have gone completely differently. Yeah. Um, I've had other cases. I had a, a, a DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, that the owners had zero dollars. They couldn't even pay for the exam fee. We, you know, we're, they're currently in <laughs> collections with us, but they're happy with us mm. because I still did an exam and took the time to sit in that room and talk with them about what I, we didn't do blood work, but I mean, this dog was PUPD, polyphagic, losing weight and exuding ketones. But, you know, we didn't do anything for that dog, but they're perfectly happy with us. And those, those are not rooms that anybody really enjoys going into. I won't lie and say that I enjoy going into those rooms because mm -hmm. they're, they're uncomfortable. They really are. Mm -hmm. But if you work at meeting the client where they are instead of where you want them to be. Yes. Yes. They, they respond to that. Yes. Yes. And I think it's important to remember, I mean, you know, bef before I, I went to vet school, like I don't think I was a very good pet parent, you know, like, Oh, something would happen. My dog would be like, I don't really want to take him to the vet. I think he'll probably be okay. You know, it's just normal. Like I did yeah. that, you know, and mm -hmm. I remember growing up, my parents, I don't, you know, I very little contact with a veterinarian. So these aren't bad people. 
And, no. uh, you know, and people are like life for all of us these days just seems to be progressively more complicated and people are busy and stressed. And sometimes they can't, they're, they're hoping that the animal is going to get better on, on his own. And uh, we should be glad that they came in at all, really, you know, because they yeah. could have just as easily let that animal suffer and die without ever yeah. seeing a veterinarian. So I'm I taking... think, yeah, like being non judgmental is, it's not always easy, but I think it's something that is going to be much better for our own mental health and much better for our interactions with clients. And it's going to enable us to help the animals more because the we don't put the clients on the defense and make them feel like oh, you're a bad person you know there's yeah. too much of that you know people just start judging 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 like and it doesn't do any good at all it's 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 hard and one of the the changes you mentioned dr hunt one of the changes since he's come into the the company and just by way of definition because we haven't expanded that you've mentioned this practice so my my boss boss owns our practice which is the nights weekends holidays emergency only and then she owns a specialty hospital about an hour away a specialty and er about an hour the other way and then three or four general practices oh. so it's not really a corporation in the same way that you think of banfield but you know she owns several different practices. So, Go her! Um, <laughs> this is a busy lady, very busy lady. So when, when Tim came in, one of the things that the practice has moved towards, and initially I was skeptical, but now I, I really believe in it, is having doctors present their own estimates. Whenever, oh, I, am, whenever I'm available, mm -hmm. Yes. So unless, unless we're too busy, mm -hmm. I make and present all of my own estimates yep. and it has cut down on, there's no, there's next to no back and forth. We used to have, okay, yeah, we make one, the tech would take it in, they'd come back. Oh, they can't do that. Make another one, take it in they'd come back. They can't do that one. And it just, it wasted so much time. It made it harder to prioritize what the owners were looking for and what I was looking for. Yeah. It, I'm sure it frustrated so the better. owner. Yes. It, yeah. and, and it frustrated us. And there was a lot of, I said, it was just, it was a lot of waste. And because there, there is slash was a movement for, yes, yeah, separating veterinarians from the money, but it just, yeah, now having done it this way, I like this so much better. I present almost all of my own estimates unless I'm physically unable to do so basically. Right. And, yeah. you know, always start with plan A, unless, unless the owner has told me up front. I only have X number of dollars, but even then I will often still take in plan A, you know, here's, here's what I really do think is indicated and would recommend mm -hmm. blood work, hospitalization, you know, I'll tell him up front, I'm not really sure why your dog is vomiting, but we'll, either way he needs hospitalization and fluids. So I'm going to put that on here and then we'll tweak it as we get the blood work and x-rays. Mm -hmm. If once I present them that, they say, Ugh, I just can't. Then the other question that has really helped is come right out and ask people, you know, okay, what is your budget for today? Right. What, what is a number that you would feel comfortable with today? Yeah. Yeah. Because one, it then makes the next estimate precise. Mm -hmm. If they tell me $500, okay, great. I'll be back in a couple minutes. I can go back and tailor one Come right. in and tell the owners, this is why I've taken these things off. This is why I've left these things on. Absolutely. And, and, and only then it's the veterinarian. Tailored. Only, only the veterinarian can explain those things. Yes. If you send a technician and, in with your estimate and the client has, has questions like, well, why do we need to do this? Why do we need to do that? That's for the veterinarian to answer. Yeah. I totally and agree. It also, it also really makes it a more collaborative thing mm -hmm. with the owners because you're really saying, okay, I hear you. I understand this is a lot of money. I still really want to help your pet. And I want to help you by staying within a budget that's going to, you know, make sure that you don't miss your mortgage payment next yes. month. So let's work together. You give me a number. I'll tailor these recommendations. And then you walk out of here not having spent more than you, you know, could swallow at least that moment. And your pet still got some care. And yes, maybe we could have done a little more. Maybe we do miss something because you declined, you know, you picked blood work over x-rays that day. Yeah. But we've had that discussion and it's documented and the things that are declined are documented. And at least you've tried, at least you've done something and made that connection with the owner. So mm -hmm. 
that's that's helped a lot. Um, yes. yeah, don't be afraid to just ask. And sometimes, you know, people are a little hesitant and you just have to come right out and say, you know, I, I really just need to know. Mm-hmm. Give me a number and I will make this, you know, we'll, we'll tweak this and try to make sure that we we fit in an okay budget. So, yep, yep. Yep. I started presenting my own estimates the last two years I practiced and it made a huge difference, a Mm -hmm. huge difference. Save time, save frustration. And usually it ended up, they ended up spending more than they otherwise would have because they understood why I was saying we should do this, you know? And uh, I would go in and I would sit next to them on the bench and and go over it line by line and explain everything. And it just made everybody feel so much better about everything that was going on. Yeah, we have little stools and we sit down and, and yeah, so maybe maybe you're not doing the full $250 blood work panel, but you get a chem 10 and a PCB and there's a hundred bucks. And so it, it, it ends up being good business sense too, because if you had just been like, Oh, they don't have any money. They don't want to do blood work today. Mm-hmm. Well, now you're out all of that and you're not getting the information that that might provide. Mm-hmm. And you're missing out on the financial portion, which, you know, matters mm-hmm. too to the business. So mm-hmm. it's, it helps mm-hmm. everybody. So yeah. that's awesome. Yay. Was that Dr. Hunt's idea? It was. Yep. Oh. He's the one that's, that's pushed that to have the doctors present their own estimates. And I, I think it's helped a lot. I think it's a brilliant idea. Wow. Yeah. I, I, if I could make one wish for all future small animal veterinarians, it would be that Dr. Hunt could be their boss. <laughs> <laughs> Love him so much. Yeah, he, he is, he's great. And he's a really good advocate for, for each of the practices and the doctors in the practices. And mm-hmm. so I'm, I'm really glad to, that, to work with him. Mm-hmm. So. It's just an amazing coincidence, you know, because you and I had this interview yeah. set up like a long time ago. We, it just took us a while to schedule it. And uh, I had interviewed him, never having any idea that he, he, you know, was the CEO of, you know, the hospitals and one of which where you work. And then I just saw you post something on Facebook about you guys looking for a doctor. And uh, some... At the end, it says to send resumes to him. Yes, yes. I was like, yeah. holy crap, that's so weird. <laughs> just a funny coincidence. Small world. Small, yeah, small world. Especially in vet med. Well, um, so... Is there anything? Which, um, actually, can I make, let me make one point about that anything. too. Yeah. Related to not being judgmental. Don't be judgmental of other vets either. Oh, because God. it is a very small community and yeah. one, things get misremembered, things get forgotten, things get turned around. Mm-hmm. It, you've got to, you know, even if, okay, that's not how you would have done something. If a client asks you, be able to say, you know, I, I usually, you know, I might use a different medication, but I can see where they were coming from when they picked this one. Or, you know, they were trying to give your pet relief for, you know, give your pet some pain relief that you had at home. Maybe, maybe I personally wouldn't have recommended aspirin, but what I'm going to tell that client is your vet's recommendation was to try to give your dog some pet, some pain relief. Mm-hmm. And they weren't able to see them, so they made this recommendation and you know, it it wasn't enough. So now you're here and we're going to look at these other things, but you cannot, cannot, cannot pass judgment on other veterinarians with the clients. Um, Oh no. It will, it will hurt you. Absolutely hurt you. Yeah. And you can't really count on what they're telling you. I I, I mean, I find in, in many cases, you know, um, I remember one case, this, this, it was a new client. She was the first time coming to our hospital and she was leaving her veterinarian after being like, he was her family veterinarian for 18 years and she was done with him. And, oh, she, goodness. and I was like, my goodness, what happened? And it turned out I, um, she had to take her dog to the ER because he, he had um, blood in his stool. So melanin. And the ER doctor said, well, you know, it's possible that the combination of the NSAID and the tramadol that your doctor had given for arthritis, you know, tramadol uh, is a synthetic opioid potential. It could slow down the, the transit of the GI tract, and this may have contributed to the bleeding. I don't think the ER vet 
necessarily should have said that. I think it would have been better for the ER vet to say, well, we see this sometimes, you know. Yeah. You know, sometimes it, pets just have reactions or don't take to a medication quite right. Yeah. You know, we, we use, this, we use yeah. these medications very commonly in lots and lots of animals. And Occasionally dogs fine. have issues. Yeah. 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 I per, I, I'm a person who's very sensitive to NSAIDs. So, you know, I, I don't think it was a good idea for the vet to have said that. I don't think the vet met, meant to imply that tramadol and an NSAID should not be prescribed together because they are prescribed together all the time. There's nothing wrong with that at all. But this woman was livid with her veterinarian. She yeah. thought he had done something terribly wrong. And that was why and she... And now that that's in her head, you're never going to get it out. Well, I told her, I said, you know... Of course, you know, as a hospital, we're always happy to have new clients, but um, not under circumstances like this. And I told her, I don't actually think your vet did anything wrong. So it's so easy for them to twist the facts around, and we must be very careful not to believe them. Just yeah. <laughs> Unless you see the medical record from the other veterinarian, you have no idea what actually happened. Yeah. And even, and even then, you don't know how the conversation went with the owner. Yes, yes. Because, you know, I, I have digital records, so I type a lot. And so probably potentially more than I need to, but very often every little bit of a conversation is documented. But if you're still using paper records in a general practice, you might have a discussion with an owner about why you should do blood work and they end up declining it. And maybe all of the nuances of that don't get written down. It was just, you know, owner, owner just wants outpatient or something, you know, or, you know, owner elects this. Mm. And the fact that, and so when you read that paper record, it looks like, oh, they didn't even recommend blood work. I can't believe that. Right. Well, they did. It just, it, it isn't record. there. Yeah. Or the owner's, the owner's response to that, you, you, yeah. Even with the record, you don't know how that discussion went. And that's true. That's true. Even a, so, a even a typewritten record. Some you know some vets write more than others. I think mm -hmm. the newer, younger vets we tend to put all of that in the record. Like discuss this, they decline. Discuss that, this is why. Blah blah blah. I think it's a much better practice to do that. But yeah. sometimes it's not there. But that doesn't mean it wasn't discussed. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Dr. Dunn, um, I, we've taken a lot of your time. I know how busy you are. Um, are. Are there any last words of advice that you'd like to offer few future veterinarians or anything you feel like we didn't cover? We talked a lot about a lot, but is there anything that uh, I haven't asked? You uh, I don't know if this is advice, but I was going to go back because I, I listened to your, to your interview with Dr. O'Kell. Oh, yes. And I, was, I wanted to make a point about your, your conversation regarding thoracocentesis uh -huh. and you had said made the comment that oh you know that's more of an ER procedure uh -huh. and as an emergency vet I vehemently disagree that that's absolutely something that when you get that 14 year old dysnic cat with quiet lungs in the general practice uh -huh. it is super annoying when it shows up at my practice still with a chest full of fluid uh -huh. <laughs> because they're you know, they're, 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 now they've had a second car ride and a they're second time to be back in that crate fragile. and a second experience with the vet. You know, when, when they're at the general practice, they're just dysnic and, you know, off. By the time they get to me, they're blue and they're agonal. <laughs> so oh, I, yeah. I think that's a, I think it's a super important thing for general practitioners to feel comfortable doing a thoracocentesis, even if you don't take a ton out, you know, if you can... Do, do one side and take 50 or 100 mils out. You will make that cat so much more stable to then be able to get to the emergency room. And even if we just end up euthanizing, which happens a lot, at least then we have the time to have that discussion because it's, it's tough sometimes when they come in, they're actively trying to die. Mm. And you need to have a couple of minutes to have a conversation with the owner. Um, so I, I would challenge that that general practitioners definitely should should try to do some thoracocentesis. You know what? That, if it's just on I, a cadaver right after you know right after the dog dies, just to feel where the ribs are right. and and feel where you're going to go. Um, yeah, thoracocentesis is actually you know if you've done it once, it's not as scary. 
but you know, like, yeah. the, like the first time you do yeah. it, it's terrifying. And before the first time you do it, the thought of it is, is terrifying. But I think you make a really good point, And I, I absolutely agree. But when I was an ER vet, I never actually got a cat transferred from a general practice who needed a thoracocentesis. All the cats that I saw that that needed thoracocentesis were like the owner was at home and noticed something was wrong and brought them in. So I didn't think of that, but you're mm -hmm. absolutely right. Like if you're general practice, don't send a dyspneic cat to the ER if there's something that you can do to stabilize the animal before you send him. Like yeah. And and same thing with with hit by cars. You know, a lot of you know big dogs that get hit by a car and they come in panting. You know, your initial assumption is that it's pain or it's yeah that broke that femoral fracture. But there's a half decent chance they've got a little bit of a pneumothorax as well. So mm -hmm. you know, a, a quick swipe with the clippers, a quick swipe with some Clorahex, mm -hmm. and do do a tap in the upper quadrant. Mm -hmm. If you get some air, you're going to make that dog a little bit more stable for a little bit longer. So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's that's really that's really great advice for for future general practitioners. Like it's not just about oh, you know, so the ER is going to handle the complicated cases. It's you stabilize the animal before you send him to the ER. At least yeah, at, at least a little bit. And to be honest, some of this gets back into business sense. If if you put that IV catheter in and start that fluid bolus at your general practice and maybe do the blood work first at that general practice and take those x-rays before you send it to the ER, mm -hmm. that's several hundred dollars that you've just kept in your practice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. versus just taking a look at the cat and going, oh, he needs to go to the ER, bye. Right. I mean, I appreciate having that business for us, but at the same time, you've just let all of that, you just let all of that walk out of, of your door. And right. what I think is the enjoyment of working that up a little bit. Yeah. If the, if the general practice does that, it's actually going to be cheaper for the client. Everything is cheaper at the general practice than it is at the ER. If you're going to have to do blood work at the ER, it's going to be a lot more expensive. Yeah, and by the time they get to us, we can put the cat, put the animal right into a run or a cage. Start, we can keep fluids going right away. We've already got the blood work to have a handle yeah. on what's going on. Yeah. I can make my my hospitalization estimate far more accurate for what's going on. Right. So having having that information helps. Fantastic. But. Awesome advice. And you had mentioned um, when we finally set up the, uh, the interview that you had some books that you read when you were a, a relatively new graduate that you thought were really helpful to you as a new veterinarian. Did you want to talk about them a little bit? Yes. Yeah. So books that I use, or I guess, yeah, another good recommendation for getting out and being a first year practitioner, any drug that you use in fourth year, write it down and write down the dose because you're going to get out and you're gonna be like, okay, I need to sedate this thing. What do I use? <laughs> I still, I still use the same doses for dexmedetomidine and butorphanol for short-term sedations mm -hmm. as we used on our orthopedic rotation fourth year of vet school. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it just write stuff down because you are, so you're going to get out and you're going to only have a few minutes in a room to move on to the next thing. And you can look it up, but it'll take extra time. So if you've already got something written down until you get comfortable with doses that you like or don't like, or until you figure out that some drugs have been crafted to match their weights, like you know, mm -hmm. Convenia, the milliliters matches their kilograms, Onsior's the same way, Serenia, you can, some of these drugs you can match to their weights, but don't know that right away. So write down the doses for things you use. Um, this is still the drug book that I used in fourth year. I think there's a newer edition. I like it. I, I have plums, but sometimes plums is tedious because it's got a list this long of doses. And you're like, I need one. <laughs> I don't need this paper use this dose and this paper yes. use this dose. Sometimes plums is a little overwhelming. So the, the Saunders handbook, um, is a bit more concise. So it's and called the Saunders Handbook of Veterinary Drugs? Yes. There's a newer edition. I think it's purple. Okay. Um, okay. Excellent. Yeah, there's a couple of these I'm sure have, have newer editions. Okay. Um, and yeah, I've got all these notes written in there. Like, you know, I, I love methocarbamol CRIs for pyrethrin cats. Uh-huh. 
that dose isn't on, isn't in here, but I got that from Justine Lee from Vet Girl. Mm-hmm. So, but it's written in here now, right? <laughs> so that I can go right back to it and find it. Yep. Um, the new version of the Plunkett ER book. I have that one. Emergency yep. proceed. Can you read me the title? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, emergency procedures for the small animal veterinarian, mm-hmm. and that's Plunkett. So, the old edition is that light, like sky blue book. That's one um, I've got. This is this is the newer one that's come out just in the last couple of years. Okay. Um, this is an atlas of, of interpretive radiographic anatomy of the dog and cat. I have that one. And it's this is all normals. Yes. Which so I, is to have super normal. helpful sometimes because you're looking at a picture and you're like, I have no idea if that's what that's really supposed to look like. Exactly. And this is something you don't yes. discover. And not only does it have... Yep, it's it's helpful for you. It's helpful to show to an owner too, because yep. an owner has no idea what they're looking at. You can say, "Here's a nice black chest full of air, and here's your cat, which is completely white." Yes. So it, it helps to be able to show. The other thing that's super helpful about this book is that they have juveniles because oh. you'll get you'll get yeah. a limping eight week old that has all these growth plates. Yeah. And you're like, I don't know. So it has it has dogs and cats and juveniles. Yeah. So so important. That's such a good point because I remember. Um, I think the the textbook that we had in vet school for radiology. I can't remember what the name of it was, but of course I had it in practice when I when I first started, and and I would look stuff up in there, and that was what was mm-hmm. missing. Okay, so here's a picture of the abnormal, but what does the normal look like? Really, really helpful to have that on yeah. hand to compare against your. Yeah, your I, still have, I still have that book too. Yeah, but I, I think I use this one more. Yeah, great and call. The mm-hmm. client education part too. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, this is also an older edition, but the clinical veterinary <gasps> advisor. I love that one. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yep. So there's a newer one that's there's a newer one that's green. This one's great because the whole first section is alphabetized by condition. Yeah. So if you get that parvo puppy in it's got your differentials it's got what lab work to run it's got what treatments to do it's got um, prognosis at the end as well Mm -hmm. so it's nice if you're like I said that the the veterinarian I worked with first year out with the cat with an eosinophilic plaque like okay we know that that's probably what it is well shoot what do I do for it you can look it up by the diagnosis and it also has um it is testing as well so if you you do blood work and you're like, crap, the GGT is elevated. What does that mean? Or the phosphorus is, you know, or I, I got one recently, this dog that was panting like crazy and its phosphorus was low. I was like, this, why is this? But that's from respiratory alkalosis that yes. this dog has hypophosphatemia. I'm like, okay, we stopped the dog from panting and that'll go away. Yeah. So it's nice sometimes to look up these lab results that's like okay what does it mean if it's high versus low what are the differentials what's the next test to run Mm -hmm. so that's the last section i Um, think the same thing happened to me with phosphorus one time in the er and i looked it up in the clinical veterinary uh, advisor i was like well i don't remember learning that in vet school that's cool no but there it is like okay well i'll never forget it you know never um this is the book that was at that vet hospital Clinical, clinical anatomy of the dog and cat. I bought that in vet school because you showed me that. Yes. 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 For anatomy and, uh, lab. This book yes. is, I mean, it's, it helps to have your hands on your cadaver, but if for whatever reason you can't go in or you don't want to go in to study your cadaver, mm-hmm. the pictures in this book are super detailed, muscle yes. by muscle, layer yes. by layer, yeah. um, you know, so that, it, it's got the, the skin off of something and all the different muscles, yeah. all nice and neatly labeled. Mm-hmm. So, it, you know, it's not a substitute for your anatomy lab, but it's a really nice substitute or a really nice addition. I also use it a lot for now if I've got um, dog bite or trauma patients that I'm going to open and address. And I'm like, one, I want a refresher beforehand of what's in this area that I might run into. Right. And two, for afterwards to be like, okay, what was that macerated muscle that I tried to put back <laughs> together? Um, I, I think it was this one on this picture. So yeah. it, it helps to make for more accurate record keeping as well so that I can 
make sure that I have that one. So excellent. Um, last one, the manual of small animal soft tissue surgery. Okay. By Tobias. So it's six, not five, but <laughs> I couldn't, I couldn't, there's no way I could leave one of these off. This one I think is super helpful for new grads because in vet school, you get the giant surgery book that's got everything from a spay to brain surgery and does it really have brain mostly surgery? diagrams not pictures yes yeah. it does yes the big ones it's got every it's <gasps> i never uh, looked like, at okay. section, obviously right like you're you're never going to look at it you're just you're not as, as a general practitioner you're never this is i would say that at least 50% of this book, if not more, are things that you should be able to do as, you know, in, in your first couple of years out. Mm -hmm. You know, it's, it's got, yeah, your spays and neuters, but it's got RNA, anaerotomy, gastrotomy, C-section, uh, splenectomy, uh, liver biopsies, um, uh, and, and the directions are clear. Hernia, mastectomy, and it's got it in color photo, cookbook <laughs> wow wow so it's got step one, step one in size here step two do this and it's got pictures to match so it's it's great mm -hmm. it's absolutely great so i still go back to that if it's um I, I still go back and look at it for refreshers when i do when i'm doing something i haven't done in a while gastropexy um yeah it's it's really helpful for that new grad because it's not filled with all of these extraneous specialist type things mm -hmm. and it's got color photos mm -hmm. and step-by-step -step directions mm -hmm. excellent that's that's uh, um, that i wish i'd had that right out of school because i was using was, the same textbook that we had in vet school and I, i'm sorry to say it it, it often left more questions in my mind than answers before i went into a surgery yeah, that's one that one of the one of the interns fourth year was carrying around, and I saw. Great, and great. so I I bought that based on that, and I still use it. Excellent! What wonderful recommendations. Well, Doctor Dunn, to close up, do you have any um, charities that you'd like to tell our listeners about, and uh, maybe just show their appreciation for your generous time and advice? Uh, they could consider making a donation. So I was going to recommend either the ACLU, um, just the national chapter, or there's an organization called Modest Needs. And that's kind of a, there, there's lots and lots of GoFundMes out there for people that, you know, I, I need to pay this bill or I need to do this. And sometimes it's hard to know how reliable that is. Right. Yeah. These so, are not 501Cs. Yes. So modest, modest needs works to um, vet some of these things so that it's, you know, hey, the, the single mom with two kids that her car broke down and she just needs, you know, the 300 bucks to pay for the car repair so she can get to work. Wow. And they vet that to make sure that it's Legit. true for starters. And then, yeah, you, when you give your donations, it's going to somebody that, you know, has, you know, you're not fixing some big thing they've got, you know, I need an electric bill or I need this, or they've got some small need in their life that you can really make a big impact in. Oh my gosh. What a great idea. I'd never heard of that. That's wonderful. So I'm going to put, I'll put the ACLU, the modest needs, uh, hyperlink in the show notes, as well as all of the books that you, you've recommended that uh, future veterinarians get. So those will be in the show notes. Well, Dr. Ashley Dunn, thank you so much for your time. It's been a long talk, but it's gone by like nothing when you're having fun. Fly time flies, right? And it's been so good seeing you again. Thank you. Thank you again for your generosity. And yeah, it was great. Podcast. I really enjoyed it. I'm really glad I could do this. 